thank you for your patience, everyone. Good morning. And uh, on this Sunday before July 4th holiday, uh, we are extremely lucky today to have uh, Dr. Uh, David Cooper uh, from uh, Mass General Hospital to uh, be giving us this talk about uh, kidney xenotransplantation and how close are we to uh, prime time. Uh, to introduce Dr. Cooper is a, uh, a major task. He's a sort of pioneer in this field and uh, I'll try to uh, do it quickly so we can get underway. So Dr. Cooper uh, studied medicine at uh, in the UK at Guy's Hospital. It's uh, uh, Guy's Hospital Medical School. It's now the uh, part of the King's uh, College in London. And he trained in general and cardiothoracic surgery in Cambridge uh, and London. Uh, between uh, 1972 and 80, uh, in 1980, he was a fellow and director of studies in medical sciences uh, at Magdalene College in Cambridge. Uh, in 1980, uh, he took up an appointment in heart surgery in the University of Cape Town, where under the pioneering uh, surgeon, uh, Professor Christian Barnard, uh, he had uh, uh, responsibility for patients undergoing heart transplants. Uh, in the uh, 1987, he, re he relocated to the United States where he continued to work in both the clinical and uh, research fields. After uh, close to two decades as a surgeon scientist, he decided to uh, concentrate on research uh, initially at the uh, Massachusetts General Hospital uh, and Harvard Medical School uh, between 1996 and 2005, uh, to which uh, uh, center he returned in 2021. Uh, his major interest is in developing cross-species transplantation, or what we know uh, as xenotransplantation, with the aim of using genetically engineered pigs um, as sources of organs, cells, and corneas for transplantation. He has published more than a thousand medical and scientific papers and chapters, most of which relate to heart transplantation and experimental xenotransplantation. He has co-edited or written nine major textbooks, really anything that has xenotransplantation in it, you'll, uh, you'll find Dr. Cooper's uh, involvement in it. Uh, in addition, uh, his book on the surgeons who pioneered heart surgeons, uh, heart surgeries, uh, open heart, the radical surgeons who revolutionized medicine was published in 2010. Uh, he has edited many other books and wrote a biography about Dr. Christian Barnard. Um, and that biography was published in 2017. Uh, when he is not uh, busy, I'm sure he has a lot of free time. Uh, he also has a pen name, uh, David Car uh, Cartwright, and he has written several plays and novels. Two of them were made it to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to actually being played and won awards. So without further ado, we are extremely lucky to have Dr. Cooper and uh, Dr. Cooper, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Zoom is yours. Oh, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Well, thanks very much for that uh, very kind introduction. Very pleased to be able to talk to you today about uh, kidney xenotransplantation, uh, because this is a topic that, as you've heard, has been close to my heart for a long time. Now, um, now I can't move this. I can't move this slide after all. Now, let me just see. Uh, what? What about? Yeah, I've got it now. So, uh, my only. Uh, 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 disclosure is I'm a consultant to eGenesis, which is a small company in Cambridge, Massachusetts, that makes genetically engineered pigs, which we're using at MGH. Uh, now, you heard I was used to be a cardiac surgeon. I'm always remember, reminded of this statement. I am sometimes reminded of the difference between a rhinoceros and a cardiac surgeon. One has a thick skin, a small brain, and charges a lot. The other is a large animal that lives in Africa. So don't expect to uh, get too much information out of me today because of my background as a cardiac surgeon. Now, I'm going to very briefly run through a couple of little points about the history of xenotransplantation, which is a very interesting topic, uh, by the way. Now, if we go back to mythology, we see lots of uh, animals here, a mixture of different uh, 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 animal species. Here's uh, a, um, a lemasu, uh, which you can see is a mixture of uh, human bird, a lion, etc., etc., and there's a whole host of them like chimera and so on and so on. In the, even as early as the 17th century, <clears throat> people were giving transfusions to patients from animal species. Actually, the sheep was a pretty uh, popular donor um, because it was thought to be rather placid and it was the, the blood from the sheep was given to quite a few patients with obvious, with mental illness. I'm sure it killed more people than it uh, cured, but it was quite popular until up to about the First World War when it was more or less banned. 
Now, Alexis Carell, most of you have heard about, who actually <clears throat> developed the technique of vascular anastomosis, um, and for that he won the Nobel Prize in 2012, and, and obviously it's the basis of all organ transplantation. He was a man of vision, and he said in 1907, the ideal method would be to transplant in man organs of animals easier to secure and operate on, such as pigs, for instance. But it would in all probability be necessary to immunize organs of the hog against the human serum, which is exactly what we're trying to do now. We're trying to modify the pig to protect its organs against the human antibody and complement activation in the human serum. So he says the future of transplantation of organs for therapeutic purposes depends on the feasibility of hetero, which was the old word for xenotransplantation. So here's a man well over 100 years ago with a vision to see exactly what we're trying to do now. Now, in this little review of the history of Zeno, this is Sergei Voronov, who was a Russian emigre living in Paris. Uh, and in the 1930s, he decided he would get into the field of xenotransplantation. And he was mo mainly interested in regeneration of uh, and stimulation of elderly men who were running out of steam, if you understand what I mean. And so he transplanted chimpanzee testes into elderly men, and he did quite a lot of them. And the whole thing caught on both sides of the Atlantic. And there was a, a surgeon in Kansas who transplanted lots of goat testicles into humans um, and made a lot of money from it until he was closed down by the JAMA. Um, and this caught on. I can't imagine that any of them did anything, but there were, there were reports of remarkable rejuvenation of elderly men getting their vi vim and vigor back again. Now, when you look at this picture of, of Sergei Voronov, he looks to me as if he needs a shot of uh, ch uh, chimpanzee testes himself because he looks rather jaded here. And in fact, it was, it's quite true. At the time this picture was taken, he just married a 20 year old uh, French girl. So maybe that's why he's looking a bit jaded here. I make fun of him, but in fact, he was a man ahead of his time because exactly what we're doing now is trying to put in pig eyelets into patients with diabetes. So to put in the cells that make the hormones or the enzymes and so on that we lack was, was his idea. And it was a good idea. It's just that he was well ahead of his time. Now, Sir Peter Medawar, a British uh, transplant immunologist who actually founded really transplant immunology, uh, he won a Nobel Prize in 1960 for uh, demonstrating that you could get tolerance to a graft, a, an allograft. Um, and this really stimulated surgeons in that time to really begin to uh, investigate uh, organ transplantation uh, in, in patients. Again, mainly uh, allo transplantation, of course, at that time. And he said, we shall solve the problem of organ transplantation by using xenografts one day if we try hard enough and maybe in less than 15 years. And that was said in 1969. So even Nobel Prize winners can get it completely wrong because we're still trying to solve the problems that we, we, we faced at that time. Then Keith Rintzmer, who was the chairman of surgery at Columbia Presbyterian in New York, he was a very visionary and he transplanted uh, six patients with chimpanzee kidneys in the 1960s, about 1963, 64. And most of them failed within about six to eight weeks. Either the patient got rejection or the patient got an infection and died of the infection. <clears throat> the immunosuppressive therapy available at that time was very primitive, azathioprine and steroids, basically. And so it, 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 you wouldn't expect them to do well, but one patient out of the six lived for nine months and then suddenly died probably from an electrolyte disturbance. She went back to school as a school teacher. So she obviously lived pretty well for nine months. And here are the pair of the kid, uh, chimpanzee kidneys at the top of the picture um, divided at, at post-mortem. And her own kidneys are at the bottom, you can see very shriveled and, and diseased. And these kidneys look pretty normal um, and very few, very little sign of rejection and so on. So it, even in those days, even with primitive uh, immunosuppression, uh, one, one out of six patients did pretty well um, after this. And I think today, if we use chimpanzee kidneys we, with the immunosuppressive drugs we have now, we do very well. James Hardy at the time uh, uh, went to see uh, Reemsma's patients and he went back and decided to do a heart transplant from a, from a chimpanzee. This is a picture he gave me of the actual heart. 
The patient only survived about two hours because the heart wasn't big enough to really support the patient. It was a very complicated uh, patient. Um, but I show this because this was the consent form that the patient's family signed. The patient himself was comatose or semi-comatose and was not in a shape to sign this form. You can't read it from where you are, but it mentions that no heart transplant has ever been performed before. This was in 1964, three years before Chris Barnard did his first uh, uh, transplant. And, uh, but it makes no mention in this informed consent form that he might use an animal heart. Can you believe, can you understand what problems we'd get into today if we had a consent form like this? But this was the norm for the time. So uh, quite remarkable. And then some of you will remember Leonard Bailey, who sadly died a couple of years back, who did the baby Faye case. He put a baboon heart into baby Faye and she lived for 20 days before she died of rejection from some complication really of the therapy that they gave. Now, if you look in the literature, the proper literature, you can see that this is going on more often than you think. Here's a, a report of a patient, a woman who receives a pig heart and now they can't keep out of the mud. I don't see this in a really good medical journal, but it's there if you, if you, if you scan the literature. So most of those, I think all of those early cases were related to non-human primate transplants into humans, our closest sort of relatives. And that was a considerable worry to the non human primates if they thought they were going to be sources of organs. But in the 1980s, we decided that uh, the pig would probably be a better um, uh, uh, source of organs than the non human primates. And this is for a number of reasons. First of all, that we could have an unlimited supply of donor organs from pigs, whereas we really couldn't from non human primates. Non human primates also don't really grow to the size of a large human, uh, so it would be very difficult. Uh, the organs from pigs would be available electively whenever we wanted them. You come in today, you need a transplant, you get it tomorrow because you've got a pig organ. The effects of brain death would be negated because brain death has quite significant in injury to the organs and to the metabolism after brain death, whereas these uh, uh, pigs will not go through brain death, they will be just anaesthetized and the organ taken out. And theoretically, we could get infection free donors, which you could never get with a human uh, organ uh, donor. Uh, and less obvious uh, advantages are that we turn down some borderline candidates if we think they're not going to do very well, um, because we, 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 we know we've got to use the scarce human diseased human organs as, as, as carefully as we can. But if you had an unlimited supply of organs, you could accept many of the borderline candidates. And if they do well for a year or two, it may be worth their while. And in some countries, particularly Japan, uh, there's a cultural barrier to deceased organ donation. And so the number of transplants carried out each year is relatively small. They're all living donor, uh, a partial liver or, partial, or, or kidney transplant. There are virtually no um, heart transplants um, and the number of patients that would receive organ transplants if we could do xenotransplantation would go up many, many fold. And then if we look at patients who need a, a cell transplant, such as patients with diabetes who could be cured perhaps with islet transplantation, we're talking millions of patients, uh, which will never resolve the problem from human donors, but we would from, from pig donors. And if you want a lot of pigs, you can give them hormonal therapy and here's a pig with, I think, 28 in the, in the litter. And so you could get very large numbers quite quickly of, of pigs. We were used to using pigs for many years. Uh, in the USA, we, we slaughter at least 100 million pigs for food each year. In China, they slaughter over 500 million to produce heparin. And worldwide each year, there's probably several hundred thousand who get a heart valve replacement using pig, pig valve. So we, we, it's not as if we're not used to using pigs for our own purposes. Now, there are a number of problems, of course, the most important of which is the immunologic problem, which I'll spend most of my time on. There's a physiologic problem. Uh, does the pig uh, kidney, for example, do everything that we would want a human kidney to do? Uh, there's a risk of infection, so safety is a problem, is a, a matter we have to consider, and there are ethical, regulatory, and legal aspects of, of xenotransplantation. So let's look at the I I I immune response. Uh, you get hyperacute rejection if you put a pig organ, very similar to that seen in some patients with ABO incompatible organ transplants if you don't take steps to prevent that happening. And what happens is the same as in ABO incompatible. We have pig sugars, uh, glycans, sticking out from the surface of the pig cell. 
and the anti human antibodies immediately bind to them uh, because they're already there and they're there because we um, as infants we develop uh, antibodies against viruses and bacteria that colonize our gastrointestinal tract and some of those have the same sugars on them as do pig cells and so we've already got uh, we're already primed with uh, circulating antibodies against these bacteria and viruses which immediately bind to the pig organ when we put that in um, and then that activates the complement system the complement system punches holes in the in the endothelium of the organ and we immediately get this destruction of the organ and here is a pig kidney put into a baboon about two minutes after it's just been reperfused you can see it looks nice and pink and healthy and five minutes later it looks like this literally five minutes later completely destroyed uh, with edema uh, hemorrhage uh, interstitial hemorrhage thrombosis etc cetera, etc cetera. here's some histology of an antibody media rejection you can see um, uh, there's thr thrombus in the, in the vessels, there's uh, interstitial hemorrhage, there's interstitial edema, there are cellular in innate immune cells in infiltrating. And if you look at the staining, you see IgM deposition, IgG, and often C4D as well. So it's a dramatic uh, destruction that happens very rapidly in, if it's a wild type uh, unmodified pig. Now, Klaus Hammer, uh, who, the late Klaus Hammer, who was a surgeon and a veterinary surgeon, he said the phylogenetic distance between man and pig comprises 80 million years. And so what we're trying to do is to outwit evolution. We're trying to overcome that 80 million years of diversion between humans and pigs. And that's why it's so, been so difficult to, uh, to, um, to, to resolve the problems of early rejection. Randy Morris, who some of you may know, who used to be a cardiac surgeon and was very, very active in research before he joined Novartis, um, uh, he, uh, some years ago, said there are three golden rules for achieving successful xenotransplantation. But then he added, unfortunately, we don't know any of them. And at the time, that was true. But today, we do know most of them, I think. <laughs> so very, very importantly, this is something we don't actually, I think, uh, uh, acknowledged sufficiently. This is the first time in 70 years of organ transplantation that we're able to modify the donor rather than just treat the recipient. And I believe that eventually we'll be able to do enough to the donor that we will not need to give any treatment to the recipient. It won't be tomorrow, but I think within the next 10 or so years, the, the development of genetic engineering is, is, is uh, is is uh, progressing so rapidly that I think eventually we'll be able to everything to the donor and that'll protect the organ from from things. So we have to have a completely new mindset here as to how we're going to uh, follow up on uh, transplantation over the next 10 or 20 years. Now I won't go through this in detail because I'm not an expert on this, but you basically take out uh, the nucleus from a cell and you place into it a nucleus or a cell from a fibroblast that has been genetically manipulated uh, through molecular biology and so you replace the standard nucleus with this genetically engineered one and then you put that into a surrogate sow and you breed uh, the, the, the piglet grows and therefore you end up with a piglet who has a modified nucleus so he's modified genetically modified cloned pig. <clears throat> now the innate immune response I mentioned when we looked at those pictures, it's antibody binding is the key, the initial thing that activates the complement system. There is coagulation dysfunction because there are molecular <clears throat> incompatibilities between the way the coagulation system works in the pig and the way it works in the human. Um, there's a systemic inflammatory response once you put a pig organ into a non-human primate that goes on for weeks. And there are changes, rec recognition of self. We, some of our cells recognize our, ourselves and so don't act against them. But if they've recognized a foreign cell, uh, foreign tissue, such as a pig, they activate against that thing. So there are a whole host of mechanisms by which we can reject this or destroy this organ. Now, how can we get around that? Well, it's almost entirely through genetic engineering of the pig. Um, we, we knock out the three known pig xenoantigens. I suspect there are others, but I think we know the three major ones. Uh, and then we also introduce human protective genes, such as human complement regulatory proteins. The pig has its own complement regulatory proteins, which prevents its own complement injuring its, its own tissues. <clears throat> but it's not very, they're not very effective against human complement. 
And so we put in human protective genes in, in the field of complement regulation and coagulation. Regulation. So we can do a whole host of things to the pig to protect it from the human immune response. And the three known uh, antigens, xeno antigens, are this galactose sugar, uh, n glycolyl neuraminic acid, a silic acid, and SDA, which is an unusual blood type. And we've got techniques now, we've knocked all three of these out of the pig. So there's no target for antibodies in a large number, at least a third of the population. Uh, now, there may be binding to other targets in the rest of the population, but these are by far the three most important ones. <clears throat> and if you look at the top of this slide here, and let's just look at the left-hand side, IgM, this is binding of um, IgM, human IgM, to wild-type pig cells during the first year of life and then into adult life. And you can see if that red dotted line is means no binding, so that's zero. We consider that zero. Um, and you can see that uh, early in in in, uh, in, 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 in or infancy, there is a very low level, relatively low level of binding. But by the time we're adults, you can see there's a very high level of binding, uh, and very similar with the IgG. But then, if you look at the bottom of the left hand corner, if you knock out those three. Uh, Zeno antigens, and again, the scale on the y axis is totally different from the one above. And you can see that nearly all of those uh, infants have no binding at all to triple knockout pigs, and even adults have a, a low level. We're talking of 1.5 instead of 200. So it's very effective in preventing antibody binding to uh, the pig tissues if you've knocked out those three xeno antigens. <clears throat> And you can see this on a cytotoxicity uh, assay. In, in, you can see at the top, the top curve is binding at various um, dilutions of human serum to wild type pig red blood cells. Red blood cells express these three glycans. They don't express swine leukocyte antigens, which are proteins. And if you knock out the main one, which is galacto, the, the gal sugar, um, you, in the dotted line, you can see you reduce the binding very you reduce the cytotoxicity very significantly. But if you knock out all three, which is the blue dotted line at the bottom, it's no, the binding, the, the cytotoxicity of pig cells is no different than the binding of, to human red blood cells, aut auto red blood cells, the, the patient's own red blood cells. So we've really got no binding and, and no cytotoxicity anymore uh, when we knock out these in the patients who uh, do not express uh, other uh, sugars. <clears throat> so we've really solved that problem to a large extent. Now, in addition, though, we, I believe certainly, and most people believe that it's good to put in human complement regulatory proteins, of which are several to choose from, human coagulation regulatory proteins to offset this molecular incompatibility between pigs and, and humans, and even anti-inflammatory or, or inhibitors of phagocytosis. And I'll give you an example of this. Here's um, cytotoxicity on the left of ground knockout cells, and you can see the cytotoxicity is about 60%. Triple knockout cells in, in this selected group goes down to 40%. But once you add um, uh, complement regulatory proteins such as CD46, CD55, uh, or other proteins, HO1, heme oxygenase, and so on, you can cut right down now when you've got a triple knockout with these added transients, you're down now to zero cytotoxicity. The dotted line again is, is, is we consider negative. And so that in patients who've got some binding, uh, some antibody binding, you can offset this by putting in complement regulatory proteins and so on and so on. Uh, so you can end up with the majority of people having no cytotoxicity against this, these pig, pig cells or pig uh, organs. But even if you get over that innate immune response, you're going to develop an adaptive immune response, just as you do to an allograft. And that is, includes, obviously, T and B cell activation. Um, and here we found that immunosuppression by blockade of the CD40, CD154 co-stimulation pathway is particularly important. Um, conventional immunosuppressive therapy, such as tacrolimus-based, is inadequate in xenotransplantation. You don't get good results. But if you block that CD40, CD154 pathway, you get much better results. Not the CD28, B7 pathway, which is an improvement on conventional immunosuppression, but not as good as CD40, CD154 pathway. 
And here's some transplants that were done in, in using uh, pigs. Um, I think these were um, uh, gal knockout pigs. Uh, and you can see in the red line is if we use conventional immunosuppression, we, the survival is only just over a month, maximum survival. If we, if we use the CD40, CD154 blockade agents, you can see in the black line, the, the survival goes up to several months. And so, the, and we and others, have, this is our data, but others have also shown the same sort of data. So we know that the immunosuppressive therapy is important to selection of the right immunosuppressive therapy. Now the immunosuppressive therapy we've been using very similar to what others have been using, and we give ATG up front on days minus three and one, but we only give five milligrams per kilogram each time. So it's not a big dose. The anti, the rituximab we give on day minus two, we only give 10 milligrams per kilo. You know that a whole co course of rituximab is 20 milligrams per kilo times four over four weeks. We just give this half of one dose. We give some systemic complement inhibition because it is believed that that is beneficial in the first couple of days. Then we give the maintenance, the anti-CD154 or anti-CD40 monoclonal, coupled with some rapamycin or mofidil or even tacrolimus, uh, which is thought to be beneficial, uh, and with a tapering, very low dose of methoprednisolone. So it's not excessive immunosuppressive therapy. And th this covers most of the problems, although not all of them. So if we use, uh, there's a drug that my colleagues, uh, Robin Pearson and, and, and at MGH have been using called Tonics 1500, which is an anti-CD154 monoclonal antibody. And if you use this in life-supporting kidney or heterotopic heart allo transplantation, uh, Tetsuo Kawai has done the kidneys, um, this, this weekly single dose of tonics monotherapy, no induction therapy, and no other maintenance therapy keeps those um, graphs rejection-free for up to, for more than six months. Then if you stop the treatment, it takes a, a couple of months for them to reject. It's quite a remarkable, I think, uh, agent. And uh, we're now testing this in the, in the uh, baboons with the uh, xenotransplants. I don't think monotherapy is probably going to be sufficient in a xenotransplant, but we should be able to reduce uh, immunosuppression, I think, fairly significantly. So the combination of organs from gene-edited pigs that I've mentioned and this novel immunosuppressive therapy has resulted in prolongation of pig organ graft survival in non primes for well over a year. Uh, Andrew Adams has got one monkey now, I think he's gone over three years. Uh, Tetsuo has got several over one year and, 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 and other groups also too. So we're getting quite, quite, quite uh, successful. Now the question is, do we need systemic anti-inflammatory therapy, which we could give in the form of say tocilizumab or something? Do we need anticoagulation, antiplatelet therapy in addition to the expression of coagulation regulatory proteins? These are things that we're not 100% sure about yet and we're still investigating. My feeling is we probably won't need much extra therapy apart from the immunosuppressive therapy. Now, just to mention this in passing, that pigs can be genetically engineered to secrete some immunosuppressive agents, for example, you can put CTLA-4IG into pig cells. They've been expressed in uh, it, the whole body, uh, in which case the pigs unfortunately immunosuppress themselves and got infections and it was too, too, too successful. Or you can put them say just into the eyelets and they will provide some local immunosuppressive therapy by secreting CTLA G from the pig eyelets. So I think this is a, a, an approach that we need to explore more fully in the future so that we don't have to give so much uh, exogenous uh, um, administration of, 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 um, of immunosuppressive therapy. Now you can see here, these are the kidney transplants carried out in the pig to non-human primate model since the first ones were done in 1989 uh, by D. Alexandra in, in um, he was the first to do the kidney, we had done the heart by then, uh, he was the first to do the kidney in, in, uh, from Belgium in 1989. And you can see in the last few years, this only goes up to 2019, there was a great interest and a great uh, so increase in survival of these organs, uh, pig organs in, in non-human primates at, at that time. However, there is a problem with the triple knockout pig organ transplant in old world monkeys. All the data I gave you is relating to human response to the to triple knockout. But many humans I've mentioned have no serum antibodies to triple knockout pig cells. All old world monkeys and baboons and so on have serum antibodies to triple knockout pig cells, all of them. 
Therefore, all triple knockout pig organ transplants in non improvements are in a sensitized animal. You're putting them into an animal who has antibodies, specific antibodies against the pig organ you're putting in. And uh, just give you an example of this, if you look at the top row in black, that's the human response. And if you look at just say the, as you reduce the IgM binding, IgG binding by with the triple knockout, your complement dependent cytotoxicity also reduces to minimal levels, which is what we've already looked at earlier a minute ago. But if you look at old world monkeys, the gal knockout makes a big difference, but the triple knockout actually if you look at IgM, actually increases the binding a little bit. And when you look at the cytotoxicity, you can see that actually the triple knockout, the cytotoxicity is still very high. And we're not 100% sure why this is, but the response of a non-human primate to a triple knockout pig organ is quite different from that we, we would expect in a human uh, recipient. And again, we've shown this in a small number. If you look in the red, this is the response the, the uh, survival of uh, triple knockout pig organs in baboons. And you can see you get out to nearly about three months if you're lucky. But if you, if you, if you do the same experiments in, um, in, uh, in, in, with a gal knockout, just a single knockout, you get much better results in the black. And so this has been a problem. And this shows you exactly how big the problem is. If you look at the IgM at the bottom, if you have very low IgM binding, say two or four, in the lower chart in black, you have the cytotoxicity that this is associated with in humans. And you can see there's basically no cytotoxicity under the dotted line if you have, say, uh, an IgM of, with a geometric mean of two. But if you look in the, in the blue at the top, that is the the same binding of two, you have a cytotoxicity of 60% if you're looking at uh, baboons, quite different. So there's, uh, we don't really know why this is the case. We have one or two leaders of uh, uh, ideas about it, but we don't know for exactly why the cytotoxicity in a baboon or, or cinnamongous monkey or rhesus monkey is so much higher than that in, of the human serum. Uh, and that has been a problem. And this has certainly hindered progress in the pig to non-human primate organ transplantation models. It'd be very difficult to provide data for the FDA to show that this is gonna work very well in humans uh, if your model is, is so significantly different. But it has stimulated the move towards clinical trials because people are saying now, we can't prove this in the, in the baboon or the monkey model. It, it, it's, not now, it's not representative of what will happen in the patient. And on the basis of in vitro data, the serum cytotoxicity binding, et cetera, of pig cells, the results of pig organ in humans should be much better than in old world monkeys, uh, because then you, know, you can choose humans who are not sensitized. Now, what about the diagnosis of rejection these days? It used to be that you, you when we had wild type and even gal knockout pigs uh, as, as sources of, of kidneys, uh, we, when they were rejecting, we saw a huge drop in platelet count and fibrinogen, and that indicated that the serum creatinine was going to go up. Nowadays, the clinical features are almost identical to that of an allograft. You see an increase in serum creatinine. You have to exclude hypovolemia because that can put your serum creatinine up, but, but, but it's not rejection. I'll come back to that in a minute. We see increased proteinuria. We see decreased renal blood flow on ultrasound, and we sometimes see reduction in platelet count still, but it's very much similar to an allotransplant. And as regard to other immunological markers, you think, well, anti-pig antibodies will be a good measure, but they're often not measurable in the serum because they're all binding to the graft. And you may see no increase in antibodies, and yet the graft is totally destroyed. If you took the graft out, as you can say with the heterotopic heart transplant in the abdomen, then you see the immediate rise in antibodies because they've no longer got a graft to, to bind to. And the T and B cell numbers in our experience remain at about 30 to 40% of the baseline using that immunosuppressive regimen that I mentioned to you. And they're really non-informative about rejection. They don't go up or down or anything when you get rejection. So there are not many immunological markers that are reliable to tell you you've got rejection. And so I think initially we will have to rely much more on renal biopsies than we do in allotransplantation just until we get, uh, get more experience of the clinical um, uh, progress of these 
patients who will have uh, pig kidney transplants. Now, occasionally in the animal model, we do see hydronephrosis. We don't really quite know why. And we do sometimes see a protein losing nephropathy, even in the absence of overt rejection. I suspect it is a low-grade immune bind binding of antibody to the graft that uh, activates uh, something or other, and we lose pro uh, we lose uh, pr pr we get proteinuria. Now, moving now to ki pig kidney function. If you've controlled the immune response, what what is your kidney function? Is it going to be as good as a human kidney? And here I won't go through them all, but there are a whole host of things that the kidney does that I'm sure you know more than I, I do about. Electrolyte uh, and blood volume regulation, plasma protein levels, the renin angiotensin system, antidiuretic hormone, uh, phosphatemia, phosphatemia uh, vitamin D metabolism, erythropoietin function. Does, does porcine and erythropoietin work in primates? We've been asking that for some time. And do renal filtration and secretion capacities diminish uh, independent of rejection? And all these are questions that we're just beginning to ask now that we seem to have more control of the immune response. Um, now, serum electrolytes remain largely normal, I'll show you in a second, and, but pig urine concentrating ability is reduced. There's no doubt about it. Pig urine is very dilute, and you therefore have to put, put out more urine in order to con, con, maintain the normal serum creatinine and so on. And I think this is one reason why some of these uh, baboons become actually dehydrated because they're putting out so much uh, dilute, dilute urine. And looking at a, a small number here, you can see between the lines, that's the normal range. Creatinine, creatinine is normal until you get rejection. Uh, albumin is on the, on the low edge, depending on how much proteinuria you've got, but it's normally within the normal range. Proteinuria can vary a bit, but we haven't seen it to be too excessive in, in most of the recipients. Uh, phosphate is usually a bit low, and we don't really quite know why until you get rejection. Uh, potassium is norm in the normal range. Calcium tends to be rather high, and again, I'm not quite sure why, but it doesn't seem to go to dangerously high levels. Um, and But what we have seen is episodes of hypovolemia and dehydration uh, in some baboons. Um, and here's an example. Uh, this baboon was doing well for you know three or four weeks, um, and then suddenly got a rise in uh, in uh, in um, in creatinine. We took it to the operating room to take a biopsy. While we were there, we noticed that the blood pressure was very low, the venous pressure was low, so we gave quite a lot of fluid, and you can see that the creatinine came down very dramatically, and the biopsy was completely normal. There was no rejection, and so this. Uh, alerted us to the fact that the baboons can't, they're unaware they're getting dehydrated and they're unaware they're hypovolemic. And if you correct that, um, the function improves again. So a rise in creatinine may be related to hypovolemia. And if it is, it is not associated with increased proteinuria. If it's a result of rejection, we normally see an increased proteinuria at the time. So you can differentiate between the two. But we often have to give these baboons extra fluid uh, intravenously or subcutaneously uh, to, to maintain their volemic state. Now, we've been studying the renin angiotensin aldosterin system, and we've also looked at uh, glomerular filtration. So I'm going to give you very briefly a couple of preliminary observations. You know more than I do about the renin angiotensin aldosterin system. It's a regulator of blood volume and systemic vascular resistance. That's why we looked at it, because we thought maybe these episodes of hypervolemia were related to um, malfunction of this system. Uh, so it acts to elevate the blood pressure. We, we, in the literature, it says that renin kidney, uh, renin from the pig kidney, uh, or renin cleaves angiotensin to angiotensin 1, a precursor of angiotensin 2. Episodes of dehydration may result from an impaired renin angiotensin system. It is known that primate angiotensinogen is a poor substrate for pig renin but it's uncertain whether pig renal will maintain the rest. So we looked at it. Um, this is a, a, a mentioning about how difficult it was to do these studies. We did them in healthy pigs, healthy baboons, and baboons with pig kidney grafts. Um, we, we had to get assays that would measure certain parameters in pig blood, which was not so easy. You have to go a lot of ridiculous edge to collecting the blood properly, um, and um, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not an easy study to do. 
But to cut a long story short, you can see on the left the normal range of, uh, pig, of renin in pigs and baboons. And you can see after the transplant, when the baboons had its own native kidneys removed, that the, uh, the renin levels stay reasonable. Uh, they, it looks here as if there's a tendency for them to fall a bit, but they stay reasonable. So pig renin is still able, and I think the renin half-life is short, but so this is clear evidence that pig renin is circulating in the, in the baboon. Um, and um, one interesting thing, the, the angiotensin levels, which are baboon angiotensin levels produced by the liver, uh, you can see on the left here, after the transplant, they actually, if anything, go up a little bit uh, rather than down. So there's plenty of angiotensin and tension again around. Um, and then aldosterone also can be measurable. Pig, uh, ald uh, aldosterone can be measured in pigs with, in the baboons with pig uh, kidneys. Um, and so we asked the question, is pig renin able to produce angiotensin two in baboons? And it does seem to be able to, although the levels can be lower than, than in the normal uh, healthy pig or, or baboon. So in, in con, some, some preliminary conclusion of that, there is no shortage of, of the substrate angiotensin which is produced by the liver after the kidney transplant. And renin secretion is maintained by pig kidney grafts in baboons without native kidneys. And angiotensin two levels are maintained after pig kidney transplant, but are at lower levels. This may represent some cleavage of baboon angiotensinogen by pig renin. Uh, there may be some intrarenal angiotensin II production from angiotensinogen produced by the pig kidney. So we still don't know the whole answer, but it looks as if there is some function of this system. And then we've looked at uh, 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 GFR by urinary inulin clearance. Uh, inulin was given as a bolus followed by a, a steady state infusion. We measured plasma levels of inulin in the baboon, and we measured urinary levels of inulin in the baboon. And to cut, again, cut a long story short, in the absence of rejection, the GFR um, was maintained between 60 and 105, which I believe is lower than normal, but is within the normal range uh, for at least the five weeks after transplant that we, we measured it. So it looks as if there is reasonably good uh, renal function from this perspective as well. One important point is that I mentioned that monkeys with pig kidney grafts are surviving now for well over a year, suggesting that the pig kidney is fulfilling all of the functions of a non-human primate uh, kidney. If the baboon, if the baboon or the uh, monkey was not doing well and healthy at a year, it would suggest that the function of the kidney is, 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 is at fault, but that is not the case. So I think kidney function will be fine in humans. One important point to note, of course, that if you have a deficiency in function, particularly this would perhaps affect the liver more than the kidney, but if you have a deficiency, for example, if you're not producing a, a protein, that uh, if you're producing a pig protein from the liver um, and you want to get a, a human protein, you can always genetically engineer the pig to produce the human protein. So we could do the same with, the, with pig kidney. If there's a deficiency, we can genetically engineer the pig from a functional perspective rather than from an immunological perspective. Now, quickly, clinical xenotransplantation, we've done some surveys when I was down in Alabama, we did a number of surveys getting public opinion and professional uh, healthcare workers opinion. And it's a, uh, the surveys suggest that hospital staff, patients and the public are generally supportive of xenotransplantation, as long as the results are gonna be relatively comparable to allotransplantation, which of course we can't guarantee at the moment. The one exception is African-Americans had significant reservations. They were six times less likely to volunteer, they said, for a, a, a trial of pig organ transplantation than human organ transplantation. And I think this is based on some historical uh, problems, uh, the eth ethics of <clears throat> clinical trials in African-Americans. Now, what experimental results would justify a clinical trial? The FDA has not been too demanding in this respect. And I believe that survival of about six of eight non-human primates with a life supporting pig organ for six months, with some of those being followed for 12 months to show that <coughs> you can get survival longer than six months. I think this would be acceptable, knowing how difficult it is to maintain non-human primates uh, who are immunosuppressed, et cetera. And this would obviously have to be in the absence of clinical or histopathological features of irreversible rejection or life-threatening infection. Now, I firmly believe 
Now, progress will be much greater in, when patients are being treated in a hospital setting. The monkeys live in a very unhygienic environment. They can't communicate with you if they're not feeling well. <clears throat> uh, we don't have access to sophisticated invest investigations, scans and so on in, in the in laboratory. And we certainly don't have intensive care facilities. So I think the chances of a patient doing well should be much greater than a, than a monkey doing well. Now, which patients will we select from a point of view of the kidney? Well, I, we've put forward the idea that patients who will likely never receive a deceased <clears throat> donor kidney allograft, even if they're on the waiting list for a long period of time. <clears throat> and as you know, there are a whole bunch of patients who never get a transplant. These would be probably most likely to be over 60 years of age, but with physiological good shape, in good physiological good shape. It would probably be blood group O, and they might well be diabetic because the diabetic patients um, uh, are at more risk from, uh, from getting complications that take them off the waiting list. So those would be the patients that we would, we, we, they, they would be patients fully acceptable for an allo transplant, but who are probably never get an allo transplant. And if you look at this chart <clears throat> and you look at the red thing, wait list while on dialysis, these are patients who have been selected for an allo transplant. They're on dialysis, they're on the waiting list, but you can see by 60 months, five years, 45% of them have been taken off the waiting list or they've died. They've either got complications or comorbidities that make them no longer acceptable. Uh, and they may have to wait another two or three years. So I think those patients, if you put it bluntly to them, that although they're on the waiting list, the chance of them actually getting a, 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 a kidney transplant is pretty small. I think those patients would be much more prepared to consider having a pig kidney transplant, even if it just gets them off dialysis for a year or two, that would be worth their while, I think. So they would have to be patients with no major comorbidities, I say with the possible exception of diabetes, and they would have to be, they would have no anti-HL antibodies that cross-react with SLA, swine leukocyte antigens. Only about 2% of patients have anti-HL antibodies that cross-react with SLA. So you're not excluding many, mo most of those patients who would benefit significantly from a pig, pig transplant. Now it's unrealistic to anticipate uniformly great prolongation of years of graft and recipient survival, just as it was in the early days of allo transplantation. Uh, and initially therefore the pig graft may prove to be a bridge to allo transplantation. As I mentioned, you may put the pig graft in while the patient is still on the waiting list, uh, which has been approved by UNOS. Uh, and allow uh, avoidance of dialysis for months or years while they're waiting for a transplant. And the quality of their life, I think, would be much better with a functioning pig organ than if they're on dialysis. And one important point is if the left side here is the IgM and the, in the middle is IgG, uh, and that is if you put a pig organ in or you sensitize a, 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 a this is a baboon, you sensitize them to a triple knockout pig xenograft, you get an increase in IgM, of course, an increase in IgG. But on the right-hand side, you get no increase in anti-baboon antibodies. There is no cross-reactivity between anti-pig antibodies uh, and, and, and uh, baboon antigens. And so you're not, you're not limiting the, uh, the, the, the pig organ transplant, even if you become sensitized to pig antigens, should not be detrimental to a subsequent allo transplant. And I think it's a very important point. That's all the data at the minute, uh, the, the data sh uh, sh indicates this. Now I've talked only about organs, but we're obviously interested in pancreatic islets, hepatocytes, perhaps for inborn errors of metabolism, corneal transplants. There's been a group in Europe did some very nice work in monkeys with a Parkinson's like disease and, and made huge improvement by putting in dopamine producing cells, pig dopamine producing cells into the brains of these monkeys. We've done some work on red blood cell transfusion, which I think eventually might all be from pigs. And there's a lot of work on heart valve, skin and tissue. So, so the potential of xenotransplantation is enormous, much more than we tend to think. So the pig, I, I think has got a few tricks up its sleeve, but it's pretty pleased to being a, being a donor for us. And here's a picture of me many years ago when I was working in Oklahoma, I tried to be a good Oki. Um, and for somebody from the South, South London in the United Kingdom, that was quite an effort for me to make. 
But I was very impressed by this Native American proverb I heard in, in Oklahoma. Timing has a lot to do with the success of a rain dance. There's no point running out to do a rain dance unless you had a look at the weather channel. And I think timing is now right for xenotransportation. We have the peaks, we have the good immunosuppressive dr drugs, et cetera, et cetera. I think the timing is right now to, to, to move into the clinic. <clears throat> and Tom Stalzer, my former senior colleague when I was in Pittsburgh, uh, he said this in 1982, history tells us of procedures that were inconceivable yesterday, like xenotransplantation, and are barely achievable today, like xenotransplantation, often become routine tomorrow. And I firmly believe that xenotransplantation will become routine in the next 10 to 20 years. So soon, making a pig of yourself will take on a whole new meaning, um, and it'll be a good meaning. And I firmly believe that one day organ transplantation for deceased human donors, uh, what we could now call allotransplantation, will be of historic interest only, and all the transplants will be of uh, pig organs. Now, my mentor, uh, when I was a young, younger man, as you heard, was Christian Barnard, who did the first heart transplant in 1967. And he told me once when we were discussing uh, some research we were doing, he said, you cannot stay in the laboratory forever. It comes a time when you have to move into the clinic. And I think the time has come for xenotransportation to move into the clinic. The patient at Maryland who had a heart transplant, I think was not a very well selected patient. The patient was in, in, in had so many, um, was so fragile and uh, dis, uh, disabled at the time that I don't think he could, he, he could uh, survive uh, the rigors of a clinical trial of, of a pig heart transplant, even though the heart transplant worked well, uh, I think the patient's general state was just so debilitated that he couldn't. But I think if we choose our patients properly, select them properly, a clinical trial now would be very successful. So thank you very much indeed. I'm happy to answer any questions if, if we have time. <clears throat> yes, of course. Thank you so much. What an outstanding uh, tour de force backing 60 years of history in a 50 minutes. So uh, this was phenomenal. I I will uh, I will start perhaps with one question regarding the uh, uh, you know the data that came out about the kidney transplants with thrombotic microangiopathy on the biopsies and the kidney xenos uh, from Alabama especially. Do you think that using the additional knockouts included in complement uh, genetically engineered I mean uh, pigs including the complement regulator could uh, help abate that problem in future settings? Well, um, you certainly don't see thrombotic microangiopathy in all of these pig kidneys. I mean, uh, if, if you're getting out a year, uh, you may see none of it during that time. I'm just not a believer in the brain dead organ donor idea. I think brain death is so uh, associated with so many other problems, um, in, inflammation, et cetera, et cetera. I, I did a lot of work on brain death many years ago. And I just don't think you'll ever be able to de de determine is the problem related to the brain death or is it related to the tr transplant? And the follow-up will be so short, you know, three or four days that it, it will be meaningless. So I think, um, I think the brain death can confuse us rather than uh, clarify things. Um, I think there's, it's quite likely that the thrombotic microangiopathy is related to the xenograft but in 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 the, the uab case that they published they saw it immediately after the transplant so again it, it doesn't strike me that it's it's just an immune response it may well have been just a response to the brain death and the inflammation that's going on there so on the recipient side you mean yeah yeah you got it well i have dr cornell has a question dr cornell please Hi, thanks. Um, good morning, everyone. Thanks for this great overview. It was very interesting. Um, of course, you don't have time to cover everything, but you touched on it a little bit in this talk, and that is the ethical implications of using pig organs for humans. Um, one thing that you had said in the beginning is that we are already using so many uh, millions of pigs for human consumption. But that's not really looking at it, I think, so accurately. Yes, that's true. But the pigs that are raised for xenotransplantation are conceived and raised and killed under very different conditions, as you are aware. And it's a categorically different kind of a pig. And I think needs to be looked at and um, justified for 
that own category. For example, um, there is an excellent article, I can put a link to it in the chat by El Sid Johnson from SUNY Upstate, who had pointed out this analogy that people are making. And she says that, for example, we send humans to war to be killed, but we don't use humans, we don't kill humans for their organs. Well, for the most part, <laughs> they are not killed for their organs and shouldn't be killed for their organs. So it's a similar kind of argument, you know, it's a categor categorically different kind of a pig that needs to be addressed, certainly. Um, and you had mentioned also, you know, the attitude of humans towards pigs. I think most people, including trans and professionals, aren't aware of all of these ethical implications, and I think we need to be aware of them. I think that might be actually a great topic for a future GlomCon um, after this excellent talk, um, but also um, the infectious complications, which we're very aware of in the era of COVID um, and the need for lifetime monitoring of, of um, you know, potential pig organ recipients and, and many other implications that, of course, you didn't have time to get into and I also don't have time to get into here, but um, definitely would encourage the GlomCon to consider that as a future topic here. Yeah, I, I agree entirely. It, 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 I think there's two, two things. I don't know if you've ever been to a pig farm when the pigs are being bred for food uh, and the slaughterhouse. Um, they, it, 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 these pigs for, for xenotransportation will be maintained under much better conditions. Uh, they will be in a very clean environment, obviously, because they'll be very valuable pigs. They'll be handled very carefully. And when they're slaughtered, they will be anesthetized and they will uh, be, die under anesthesia, quite different from a slaughterhouse pig. And so I think these pigs will be, be leading a much better life than the average pig. Um, and, and I'm sure the ethical aspects are very important, but I think if we're prepared to slaughter millions of pigs for food and other reasons. Uh, this is a minor uh, step forward. Uh, and in fact, from the pig's point of view, it's, it's much more preferable to be uh, killed for your organs. So I think, uh, you, I think you can certainly defend this uh, very easily if you're gonna use pigs for this purpose. I mean, we use pigs for the, the heart valves, but they're just slaughterhouse pigs. But, uh, and, and the valves, of course, are very simple structures and don't get hyperacute rejection. But in young people with a vigorous immune response and with a strong uh, rap rapid metabolism, they do fail within a year or two. And then you have to, in teenagers, you, you wouldn't put a pig valve in now because they are rejected slowly over the period of time. Yeah, I think it's a very important topic. I think it would be a very valuable topic, to to topic for, 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 for your group to discuss, but I think- Absolutely, absolutely. We will uh, definitely add it to the uh, list of, the long list of topics. Perhaps, I know we're over time, but we started a couple of minutes late, so maybe we can, uh, we can indulge ourselves one more question. The uh, renal physiology uh, person in me uh, asking a question, when you mentioned the dehydration and the uh, uh, diure diuresis, like over diuresis and some of the baboon, baboons did you notice that these guys were the same guys who had uh, these pigs uh, these uh, baboons were the same pigs who had hypercalcemia and low fos because hypercalcemia could act as a diuretic yeah um, they virtually all have hypercalcemia and low phosphate so i don't think we could differentiate those that got um, that, that got um, uh, de dehydration and so on uh, we've seen this very commonly. Now, most other groups haven't reported the dehydration and the hypervolemia. I don't understand why, because we've seen it very commonly and, and uh, been forced to, 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 uh, um, to augment the in intake of the baboons. They don't seem to be, don't seem to realize they're getting very dehydrated. Um, so it is a problem, but um, uh, it, whether it will be a problem in humans as well, I think it will, but but then you can tell the, the human patient, okay, you've got to drink three liters a day or something, whereas the baboon is difficult to arrange that. That's the, uh, the the magic of the thirst mechanism, I guess. I have Dr. Mario Rubin uh, having a question. Uh, thank you, Catherine. Um, great review, Dr. Cooper. Now, a couple of questions for you. The first one is, why did you all choose 
a C1 esterase inhibitor as your anti-complement agent, why did you go so proximal in the complement cascade? You think we should have used eculizumab? Well, I have, to be honest with you, I have no idea. I think that uh, there is data, for example, from Stan Jordan on the management of human antibody mediated rejection. They're conducting a trial with uh, C1 esterase inhibitors, um, you know, because certainly Equalizumab did not do the trick, but I just wonder if there is something unique to no. see transplantation. No, the reason, there's a good reason we don't use Equalizumab is it doesn't, doesn't work in non-human primates. So that rules that out. Uh, so the, the number of anti uh, uh, complement agents available to us is pretty limited. Uh, and we've latched on to C1 esterase inhibitor just because it's available, not really because it's been proven to be better than anything else. So uh, it's certainly an area that we, we need to look at in, in, in more detail. Um, but it seems to um, reduce the initial sort of uh, uh, systemic uh, uh, complement activation uh, which for the first few days, which we think is important. But a lot of these things, we have very little evidence. You know, the number of um, non-human primate experiments we base a decision on might be two. Um, and so it's, it's not based on really strong science, just because you, the cost and the time involved, uh, expense of doing it is just prohibitive when you're looking at non-human primates. The non-human primates I get at the minute cost me nearly $10,000 each just to purchase let alone maintaining them and so on. So you're, we're very limited in, in what we can do. And so we make decisions based on somebody else's uh, experience or, or very little experience of our own. But you're right, it may be there are better anti complement agents we should be using. Um, the second question I have for you is something that uh, Dr. Cornell touched on the infectious diseases side of things. The Maryland recipient uh, heart uh, had a big virus. Uh, where are we in the, that regard? Uh, if Dr. Jay Fishman will allow you to share the experience. Yes. Um, uh, the the uh, pig that Maryland used was bred or, or, or it's cloned actually and brought up uh, housed in a, a clean pig facility which they we they built there when I was there um, and so they've they've eradicated the vast majority of viruses and bacteria from those pigs but as you know you you get rid of CMV by early weaning from the sow um, and we did this 20 years ago when I was at MGH previously um, and I think they probably just took it that uh, the early weaning was always successful. But as Jay Fisherman points out, you can easily get re, uh, reinfected with CMV. And I think the test they used, which was negative pre-transplant, was probably not the most sensitive test. They've now developed or they're using a more sensitive test to ensure that uh, you don't miss that in, in the future. But I think there is always going to be a risk that... Uh, your, your system of excluding uh, infectious microorganisms may not be 100% successful. But when you look at human organ transplants, we know that we're transferring CMV, we know we're transferring all sorts of diseases or, or microorganisms. So we, I think we should be better off with pigs. Um, and once we know exactly and we get better monitoring, I think we'll probably eradicate uh, most of the pathogenic microorganisms that we want to. But it is, it's always going to be something we have to look at very carefully. Now, whether they, I've just been reviewing their paper uh, that they just published in the New England Journal of Medicine. I don't think the CMV played much of a role in the failure of the graft or the failure of the patient. I think it was much more the patient was just too debilitated. And they, because his plasma proteins were so low, they gave him intravenous immunoglobulin. Uh, which we had studied previously and, and thought was safe if you were, had a triple knockout peak organ in there, there were no antibodies. But I think that the, the, the association between giving the immunoglobulin and developing rejection was so uh, close in this particular patient, I think the immunoglobulin must have had some anti pig antibodies in it or something in it that activated and got uh, an initiated rejection, which was the original, which was the real, the final. A reason why the graph failed. Thank you. Fantastic. 
Dr. Cooper, perhaps one last question to close this uh, this uh, this uh, this great uh, talk. Uh, we had a question about size mismatch and uh, how do you how do you go about the problem where uh, you know the humans are much bigger than than some pigs and how how especially heart transplants orthotopic heart transplant would, would that be abated by um, additional genetically genetic engineering big yeah. size or small size well it, it is being done already the the revivical pigs and the pigs in germany they they now undergo a growth hormone receptor knockout so they grow more slowly um, um and this is going to be particularly important for the heart, where you have a more limited space for the heart to develop. I think it's not so important for the kidney because we, before we had growth hormone receptor knockout, the kidneys would double in size in the first three months, but you had plenty of space in the abdomen for that. But with the heart, it is more important, particularly if you're thinking of doing heart transplants in infants and neonates, uh, which I think is a, is a strong case can be made for that because those patients who are born with complex congenital heart disease who would do very well after a allo transplant, heart allo transplant, uh, often don't make it till they get an allo transplant or they have some palliative surgery and don't, don't do so well. So I think there'd be a good case for bridging with a pig heart uh, for the first few months till you get a human heart. Um, there, is a, there is a problem, the hearts do grow quickly, um, at, but with the growth hormone receptor knockout, they grow more slowly. Um, and so I think size matching will be easy. Now, eGenesis, who I'm consulting for now, they use Yucatan miniature swine as their basic um, thing rather than just domesticated uh, large white pigs. And so they grow much more slowly anyway. So I don't think you need to put in a growth hormone receptor knockout. Um, uh, and one, one thing that we did have some problems with the growth hormone receptor, that the, it seemed to affect the ureter, the structure of the ureter in some way. And so I think there are some things we need to sort out about that um, uh, before we go ahead with that. But for the heart, I think it, it's an advantage if you're not using a miniature swine as your, as your source. So uh, yeah, it's something we've, we've spent quite a bit of time on and we will continue to spend some time on it. Size Fant important. Fantastic. Well, I, I can't thank you enough, Dr. Cooper, for joining us on this Sunday, uh, at, on a July 4th weekend. And, uh, uh, on what it what it turned to be an, an amazing uh, uh, amazing talk about something very timely and something uh, uh, that 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 we as an nephrologist uh, are are actively learning about and uh, we very appreciate uh, the talk and I appreciate the attendance uh, from across the world. Uh, we will be back uh, in August. We thank you so much and I hope you have a good long weekend. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Cooper.